when people are trying to represent otherness or, or difference in terms of sexuality, if something is being used as a weapon, like you know, like you say, if, if something's basically being turned into an analogy for sexual identity, sexuality, or um, sexual enjoyment as a threat, then you automatically have to kind of question, like, well, why why are they doing that? Welcome to Speculative Sandbox, your audio playground for creative storytellers. My name is Vicki Lawn, and each episode, I and a guest will unpack a fiction trope with an eye for character development and narrative structures. Make sure to look for Speculative Sandbox on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, where you can join the conversation. Leave comments or questions, or let us know what other tropes we should cover. When the real world just doesn't cut it, let's get lost in a fictional one. Digital publishing expert and writer Nick Coveney joins Speculative Sandbox to talk about sexuality in speculative fiction, specifically the evolution of LGBTQ representation. We discuss how fiction can be used to challenge norms, the pressures and importance of representing a marginalized group, the political backlash to having more diverse voices in books, and how authors like J.K. Rowling can hurt a community. Also, do you love X-Men? Stay for the deep dive at the end. How's it? How's the weather out there? Um, it's absolutely stunning, which is actually a bad thing because London cannot cope with heat. We're not really designed for it. Um, mm. And we've had a record heat wave. I don't know if it's made the news over there, but it, it's been a lot this year. Um, you know, we don't have AC units in our houses because uh, most of them are pretty old. And it, traditionally, you know, like 50, 60 years ago, we wouldn't have needed an aircon unit. They just they didn't exist. Um, so we can't cope as a country when it gets too hot. And we've had a record heat wave that's been lasting for about two months. Um, oh so gosh. it's getting pretty bad. Like our garden is just dead. Like all of the grass has died. Um, they've banned people using hoses in their back garden to try and stop there being a drought because they're worried about water shortages. Yeah. So yeah, it's getting a little bit intense. <laughs> wow. So I live in Arizona and I probably I might might the where I live is not equipped for <laughs> flooding or snows but we are probably the one area that's used to extreme heats especially in the Phoenix area where it feels like you're walking around in an oven during the summer and I hear about the extreme heat hitting you guys um, that has been in the news and I think we also have it along our northern area as well like Washington and they have the same problem where they don't have air conditioning units and it's kind of scary to be thinking about how this is affecting these communities um, because you don't have the infrastructure to support that temperature. Yeah. And also because because of that, um, you know, we, we have a lot of green space traditionally and that's now all basically turned to straw. So like everybody's garden is and all of the grass lawns are turned into just like dry, dead grass. Wow. And all of our parks in sort of uh, countryside it's basically a tinderbox um so we keep having wildfires and stuff where you know th that would be something unheard of 10 years ago mm -hmm. wow well you stay safe i i'm sorry you guys have to go through that it's it's crazy you guys having that uh over the last couple of years i know northern california was dealing with very similar situation where they had forest fires everywhere i would uh zoom with my friend and he would constantly be in the background would be like a red sky and ash falling from the sky. It was, it was apocalyptic. It was so scary. It's uh, yeah, it's really quite troubling. And yet it doesn't seem to be kind of uh, creating the kind of attention you'd expect it to. Obviously that there's a lot of things happening in, in terms of global politics, but um, it's just fascinating that everybody's still focused on uh, how we can just keep going with the current status quo rather than actually trying to change things. So yeah. I, I don't know what more hints the planet needs to give us that this isn't sustainable and that we're doing a bad job, but just doesn't seem to be landing at the moment. Yeah, I, I feel like as long as pe the, I guess the wealthy and the people in power feel like they can just power through it and us lowly types just got to suffer, I guess that's just how it's going to be. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if you've seen um, Don't Look Up, but um that that film that came out I think it was last yes. year uh-huh I have seen that yeah 
Yeah, the, the just I, I think the problem is all those people assume that they'd be on that rocket. And therefore, all, yeah. of our, all of our leaders and power makers are kind of like, well, if anything does happen and this planet dies, I can afford to buy my way onto that uh, mm -hmm. spaceship illicitly. So what do I care if, you know, every other lay person dies because it's yeah. not going to affect me? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm just waiting for the people who think that they're the ones that are going to ride on that rocket to realize, oh, no, I don't qualify. I'm not that high up. And they could have done something and didn't. And now they're screwed. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, while we get through these very tough and scary times, um, especially I look at uh, I have family in Texas, too, and they were dealing with some really scary flooding recently. Um, I guess we'll talk about sexuality and speculative fiction. So thank you so much for joining me. I know this is something that we've been working on getting uh, together for a while, and I'm just really thrilled that we were able to make it happen. So Nick, tell me and our listeners about yourself and some of your recent projects. Thank you. Um, I'm Nick Coveney, and I'm delighted to be here uh, chatting to you today. Um, my background is uh, working in trade publishing here in London, UK. Um, I've worked for a number of publishers, including um, some of the big five like Hachette UK and HarperCollins. Um, I've also worked for some smaller independents and I used to be an editor many, many moons ago. And then I kind of became a digital product, um, digital publishing specialist. And I started working on apps and enhanced ebooks and audiobooks. Uh, and then I ended up um, working at Rakuten Kobo, who are um, a leading ebook and audiobook retailer, uh, as well as a tech company that make Kobo devices, uh, very similar to Amazon's Kindle devices. Uh, and now currently I'm working as a sort of freelancer in the digital publishing space and uh, working with a couple of startups um, on things I can't really talk about yet, but it's all very exciting. And on, on top of that, I'm also um, an author myself. So I'm currently uh, querying my dystopian uh, YA fantasy novel. Very cool. So now I've got to ask, what are your thoughts on the latest acquisitions and the situation between Simon Schuster and Penguin? Um, I think that the merger is potentially very dangerous. I understand the um, sort of thought driving it. I, I, I realize why the industry wants to continue consolidating, um, but I do think that it puts a lot of power, um, particularly acquisition power, in the hands of one holding company, which is very, very dangerous. And I, I think it's fascinating because it looks like the Department of Justice is really um, recognizing this as a threat and kind of clamping down to stop it in a way which it hadn't done previously. Um, going by, back a little bit um, to what we were just talking about with my career history, I used to work for Hachette back when Hachette UK were the number one publisher here in the UK. And what happened was, um, you know, Random House published Fifty Shades of Grey. And that became such a huge international phenomenon that they then acquired Penguin. Um, so wow. Penguin, Penguin, who used to be like the second or third biggest player, got bought up by a smaller one because that publisher had grown so much from um, publishing Fifty Shades of Grey globally. And then they leapfrogged Hachette and became the global number one publisher. And, you know, that's all driven by Random House's parent company, Bertelsmann. So that, that's a huge media uh, conglomerate in its own right but it's just kind of fascinating that they've already let frog to be the number one player in the industry and now they're trying to acquire some interest as well and you know the, the number one player will cannibalize the fourth player of what used to be um, traditionally called as the, the big five publishers I, I don't think it's very healthy um, particularly for the kind of overall ecosystem of publishing um, small independents are doing a fantastic job and I think in a weird way when these big publishers get bigger, that kind of creates more of an opportunity for the other end of the market. But for, for all of the other competing businesses, um, it's just gonna make things far harder because like auctions or acquisitions, it, how do we know that um, Penguin, Random House and Simon Schuster are going to do everything they claim they'll do Yeah. to, to keep the industry buoyant? It just, it doesn't seem like it's a, a good thing for, for authors or for readers long-term. Mm -hmm. It's only really good for, the holding companies uh, involved in their profit lines. Wow. Yeah, I saw that Stephen King recently testified, um, making the very, very valid point that it's going to be especially harder to bring in new voices uh, as authors when, if this happens. So now, now that you're querying, how does it feel to query, to be on both ends, to have experience in both ends, I guess you can say? 
Oh, it's, it's kind of horrible because I feel like I know too much. <laughs> because, you know, I, I intimately, you know, like I know what, what agents' lives are like. I used to work with agents. I used to acquire from agents. I was a commissioning editor before I started specializing in digital products. So I know exactly what the process looks like. And I, I keep having a, a few sort of like nibbles on the hook, but so far mm. um, and no sort of firm offers of representation that I can accept. So I'm hoping that uh, some of the, the current agents who've asked to review my full manuscript will bite, but I know that I've also written something that's a little bit um, ambitious for a YA novel and it's, it's a little bit unusual. So I'm probably trying to do too much at once and being a bit too bold, but um, because I do know so much about it, I know that there's also, you know, getting an agent is just getting yourself basically onto the starting block mm. and that's where the, the the real game begins of you know going out on submission and not every author who's agented ends up uh with a publishing deal so it, it will be an interesting process but um yeah it, it's both blessing and curse because I I know all of the stages and I can kind of try and rationalize in my head okay you know this needs to happen and agents are this busy and this is how long the cycle will take but also at the same time I feel like I know a bit too much about it. It's uh, yeah. a bit painful because I can see too far down the road and it gets a bit dizzying. Yeah, when I got my agent uh, a couple of years ago, I remember having this great sense of accomplishment. And then I realized, and I don't know why I didn't realize this earlier. I was like, oh, I have to do that entire process again, but with editors. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think I had, I don't know, how, you know, when you feel like you've, you know, you've passed you pass the finish line and then you realize the actual finish line is like another hundred miles down the road. Uh, and now the submission process is so slow. It took two years for my manuscript to be accepted by an editor and then actually read by the editor. I couldn't believe it, but that's the norm now. Yeah. I mean, I think the thing is that there's so many issues at the moment in terms of um, publisher you know, publishing staff burnout, um, both for, for agents and for people working in-house and publishers. Everybody is being stretched so thinly um, and being asked to work across so many books or so many projects simultaneously that rather than speeding up, which is what we all thought would happen with the advent of digital publishing and self-publishing, you know, I remember when people were saying, right, in the future, acquisitions process will take three weeks or three months. And the truth is, for like a celebrity or say you know E.L. James newest Fifty Shades book if that happens that would be the case because it's a dead cert everybody would just rush it through everyone would drop their real normal you know day-to-day -day priorities <laughs> and books like that can hit the market super quick but for, for for every other sort of regular author um and particularly for debut authors who are just trying to sort of enter the ecosystem it takes like upwards of 18 to 21 months just because everybody is so so thinly stretched already. Um, mm. they, they can't work any faster than that. And I think it's it's a, a real sort of challenge and it, it's making you know me consider self-publishing because I also know a bit about that and I know I could do that if I wanted to. Um, but it, it's just, it's tricky, right? Because if, if publishers need to commission two years in the future, there's no guarantee that the market trends they're trying to observe now and cater to will still be as relevant in two years time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's such a, a lag. <laughs> I have anxiety about that too, because the book that is currently on submission combines science fiction with uh, women's fiction. And it's gotten, you know, it is a little bit, it's a genre blender. And while I hear that people want genre blending, I'm noticing it's hard to get it across the finish line because it's so different. And meanwhile, I'm watching a lot and it has a uh, Asian American uh, POV. Meanwhile, I'm watching those types of stories getting released right now. And I'm like, if only I had been on that boat two years ago when we started this, I'd be right on with the trends. And now I'm like worried that I'm missing, missing it entirely. I'll try not to worry too much because the good thing is that, you know, if those books hitting the market now um, do well and, and show that there is an appetite, um, particularly for that, um, POV then and then hopefully that will help you in the future you know like it it's one of those weird things I mean my um my YA um is very queer uh unsurprisingly maybe <laughs> given what we're going to be talking about in a bit um so like I've got um gay rep bi rep um and non-binary representation in my uh YA debut and I I hope that that's the kind of thing that we can have now in a book which is more kind of like a dystopian contemporary fantasy uh mm -hmm. you know in a post heartstopper world um it feels like you know the queer community should be able to have myriad stories and not just fluffy 
uh, high school rom-com type settings. Like, I think life's a bit broader than that. Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see. But in theory, what might happen is that, you know, those books hitting the market now, if they do well and build up a good track record, that could actually like be useful in terms of um, having good comparisons. So that, you know, like mm -hmm. when they're talking to booksellers and going out to, to the wider, because that's the other thing, like once a publisher buys it, then it just like moves on. It's almost like uh, in a computer game, you know, you beat one boss and then you find out that actually it's one of those horrible bosses that's got like three or four different forms. <laughs> yeah. And the agent in querying bit is just like phase one mm -hmm. and then publisher is phase two. And then the final form is like it actually going, going to market and going into readers hands, which is both, you know, the best, but also the biggest and scariest bit. So yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about then sexuality and speculative fiction. And I didn't include this question. I just thought of this question. So I might be surprising you with it a little bit. Uh, okay. But knowing that there is a lot more LGBTQ inclusive narratives that are in books now, and they're really kind of starting to get the wave going. I know that they've been trying for a while and now it's becoming a lot more commonplace. You're seeing a lot more of those stories on Netflix, for example, especially in America. And maybe you could speak to this in, in the England area, but I've noticed that it seems like in response to having more LGBTQ voices, the conservative perspective is starting to push back and we're starting to see an introduction of some very oppressive policies and book banning. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and I'm actually really glad you asked because um, I think that uh, a lot of your listeners might not be aware of um, some legislation we had here in the UK called Section 28. Um, but th that was basically a policy which um, predates, you know, Florida's Don't Say Gay Bill. Um, and it was introduced by Margaret Thatcher in the 1980s. And it stayed effective in schools in the UK all the way through until like 2003. So when I was at secondary school, we had a policy called Section 28 that was part of the, the law of the UK that meant that schools could not promote homosexuality and the full wording was that they could not promote homosexuality as a pretense at a normal family relationship mm. so what what that led to unfortunately was a lot of um you are, for want of a better word i'm going to say bigots but you know a lot of um people with extremely conservative values or very right-wing people who don't believe that lgbtq people deserve to have rights or deserve the, the opportunity to exist um, those individuals interpreted that law as meaning that they couldn't and wouldn't already say anything positive about um, gay people, bi people, um, but they could be as negative as they liked. So mm -hmm. some of the worst bullying I experienced when I was at school because I got outed at 15 back in 2001, some of my worst bullies were actually my teachers which is a horrible wow. kind of, you know, and it, it's scary, but you know, like I I honestly could never have dreamt of reading a book that represented me, my sexuality or my kind of life when I was at school. That just didn't exist. There was there was certainly no YA being published in the UK that catered to it in the early 2000s. Um, and the only novels that I could get my hands on, um, you know, I'd have to go to the local library and, and ask for it myself. And, you know, I ended up with um, my relatives who have been very supportive, thankfully, of my sexuality giving me books that you know they knew had a, a queer focus or featured um men who fall in love with other men but that was pretty much my only outlet because it just wasn't featured in our schools and i think you know now thankfully that law got repealed but there are horrible rumors that um in the uk we might have a similar legislation introduced soon that will basically do the same thing but attacking the trans community um which will make it illegal for schools to talk about trans and non-binary people and that's that just shows how warped the kind of political ends has got. And I, I think it's it's definitely um, a worrying challenge, but I think some of it really is just the, the way these um, organizations work isn't so much that because there's more representation they're lashing out, it's because they they identify it as a, a friction point, I think. So mm -hmm. that, you know they they know that there's a lack of understanding about this one issue. And it's it's interesting to see how in the UK at least at the moment, the primary focus of the bigotry 
is attacking the trans and non-binary community because that seems to be like a, a almost like a wedge issue which can be used to fracture communities and people who you might expect to be liberal uh who you might expect to be supportive of individual freedom of expression and you know who maybe 20 30 years ago would have would have been very supportive of someone sort of saying like this is how I choose to live my life because it's being framed in a way that makes them feel like there's a danger and a threat mm. it's this kind of othering which is actually very very pertinent to the world of speculative fiction itself but because uh, trans and non-binary people are being singled out that's being used um, to sort of weaponize it and harm everybody but the, the thing is this all gains momentum and you know you, you have people now like I, I sometimes get into to rouse with people on online on Twitter and Facebook or whatever because I'm very strident in trying to um, be vocal about being a trans ally about you know my beliefs in inclusivity and, and the importance of you know having inclusive education because for me you know, I had to basically uh, set up a gay youth group when I was 16 with my local council to learn about safe sex because that wasn't in our school curriculum. There was no provision at all that taught me about, you know, the need to use condoms when having male partners and stuff like that because it just wasn't wasn't catered to. And it's a really important thing because otherwise you just have generations of queer youth growing up learning about, you know, their sexuality through a lens of pornography Mm -hmm. and the mainstream me media representation of it which is always going to be skewed as a kind of negative um and now you know i find that when i'm trying to communicate these things online i instantly get responses like okay groomer you know like wow. that's being used as a as a callback and all i'm saying is that like you know you should acknowledge that these things are beneficial and that they help people and that if you don't create it then you create a vacuum right that, that's the problem if you don't have good representation for marginalized communities then you're you're leaving space and that space will kind of get filled by the internet and i think when it comes to sexuality particularly in terms of like sexual health and safe sex that will actually just become porn right because if, mm -hmm. if people can't find information that's going to be educational and helpful to them when they're um on the internet they're just going to find really sexualized stuff instead which is really bad so you know ironically these people who are attacking everybody who's trying to fight for better representation are perpetuating cycles of um you know harmful behaviors themselves and they just use it as an instant put down like there's no there's no real dialogue there it's just an insult now it's just thrown around um and that's quite scary so when we look at sexuality and speculative fiction, it's very interesting because I think it really depends on who's writing it, when it was written, and how speculative fiction can be used to express sexuality, especially based off of the time that it could have been written as well, metaphors and all that stuff that could be taken with good intentions or misinterpreted as negative. Uh, for example, um, I'll pull out a trope, but like alien relationships, right? You can say, you can see that as a metaphor for, uh, in science fiction, as the acceptance of of people who might not be considered the, the main uh, demographic, but some people might see that as, no, they are truly alien. And you just got to make sure that it's interpreted correctly. Or you're looking at the right stuff. So let's define sexually and speculative fiction. I want to ask your thoughts on this. I wanted to find some sort of website or sort resource to help me kind of figure this out. I found enacademic.com. I'm guessing en means English. Uh, but what the way they define it is science fiction and fantasy have traditionally been puritanical genres oriented toward a male readership. They can be more constrained than non-genre literature by, the, by their conventions of characterization and their effect on depictions of sexuality and gender. However, speculative fiction also gives the freedom to imagine societies different from real life cultures, making science fiction an inclusive, an, an incisive tool to examine sexual bias and forcing the reader to reconsider his or her cultural assumptions. What is your thought on that definition? Um... I, I like a lot of it. I think that, that it's quite broad brush um, and, you know, particularly in, in what it's saying about, you know, traditional fantasy and, and science fiction. I think, you know, the, the er text that a lot of people look at when talking about sci-fi and speculative fiction, things like Frankenstein, Frankenstein has kind of inherently uh, got a queer lens to it because there's this, this weird sort of tension between not just Frankenstein and the monster but um the explorer who discovers Frankenstein and the monster and there's this kind of like 
male on male gaze thing, which is really fascinating. But, mm. you know, Frankenstein is a, a deeply, deeply um, queer book in many ways. <laughs> like the men kind of dominate it. There's barely any uh, female characters who are allowed to be anything more than a corpse uh, or, you know, a victim and then a corpse um, because th that's just the, the way Shelley wrote it. But it's quite fascinating if you think of um, her relationship with Byron and his famously uh, kind of multifaceted and slightly confusing sexual identity and sexuality. Um, you know, we don't know whether or not Byron identified as uh, bisexual because bisexual wasn't really being used in the lexicon at the time. Uh, we know that he had relationships with men and women and we know that he, he you know, was quite... Um, quite extrovert and quite um, bold for the time in terms of being open about those things. So if you look at Frankenstein in that lens, like Frankenstein is is a great um, book for representation of sexuality in um, sci-fi and speculative fiction, arguably. So I, I don't know that, that I agree with the idea that, you know, that it's something set in stone, that it's inherently restrictive. But I do think that for a long time, particularly, the sort of early focus of um, 20th century and 21st century speculative fiction. It, it did seem to be something that for a long time, particularly once we moved into the pulp era, was kind of like just glossed over or so um, marginalized that, you know, you, you blink and you miss it type references mm -hmm. where you, it, a lot of it then boils down to interpretation. You could, you know, have huge debates about whether or not something is or isn't trying to um, represent sexual identities and sexuality in that way or if it's something that's you know like you say deliberately being misinterpreted or people almost um clutching for representation and trying to like reinsert themselves back into it like deliberately queering it um so I, I like that definition but I think that it's got a few things that I would probably tweak and fine tune yeah it seems like it's catering um to the straight perspective rather than being inclusive. I think that's a really, really good point. So how do you see sexuality being portrayed in fiction traditionally before we break into how we how we break those rules later? Um, I mean, it, it does depend a little bit on the, the genre and the art. I, th I think that, you know, for so much of um, traditional um, fiction, particularly in the speculative world, a lot of it is sort of, um, replicating a sort of biblical scenario, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. last two last two humans on X new planet or something, or, or new race on this alien world, and they have to go forth and breed like crazy. Um, and that becomes inherently heteronormative in mm -hmm. most cases. So I think, you know, when, when sexuality is reduced to just being like a, a biological um, function, that in itself it can be quite reductive but the other thing is that obviously here in in um on our on our home planet uh, um, blended families are becoming a thing mm -hmm. and it and it's a bit of a fallacy um to pretend that that you know queer couples can't have kids or, or can't breed or you know wouldn't ever have offspring of their own because it's just not true and um, you know whether or not um there's a um, IVF process in that or, or something more far-fetched in a speculative world is a is a question but it's just it's really fascinating because I think that for decades people would sort of shut down any kind of like well of course it's not you know excluding other sexualities because it's not like you could have babies anyway I was like mm. well uh, actually <laughs> you know like we, we can and we do and also we, we did for the decades like it's just that those families would often um be kind of hidden right because they weren't officially recognized mm. sort of like legally but also by society but we've been here, you know, queer people have existed for millennia. It's nothing new. That, that's this um, thing I find really fascinating when I, I meet people who are like, oh, but, you know, this is all madness. It's all very modern. Tell that to the ancient Greeks. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. No, I, I totally get it. And how um, that, that biblical that biblical um, inspiration, uh, one of the, this isn't a book, it's a movie, the movie It Follows. Uh, when you are, I'm t I've heard that it's a metaphor for sexually transmitted diseases, the idea that you have sex with somebody and then this creature. Have you seen it follows, by the way? I should probably ask that first. Not, not, okay. not yet, but I'm <laughs> maybe I don't want to, but <laughs> carry on. 
it's about when you are followed by an entity and all it does is it walks towards you and you can run away and it always just shows up again. And, and ultimately what happens is once it gets you, it kills you. The only way you can ward it off is by having sex with someone and you passed on that haunting entity to that person. And so um, what it talks about, what it's supposed to be is like the dangers of unprotected sex and how it leads to diseases and that can kill you. But it's like, oh my God, can we be more scared of sex if that's the uh, metaphor? And, you know, to me, it's like, I grew up in, I mean, Arizona, it's a very conservative place. My mother was very religious that, you know, during the nineties, I had to kind of realize what kinds of things I was like conditioned to understand just by pure exposure to things, right. You didn't have a lot of diverse uh, stories, but I just knew that something like I felt very oppressed as well. And so as I'm breaking out of that, you know, growing up and learning otherwise, it's like, we don't need to be fearful of sex. That is such a, you know, abstinence only kind of way of thinking. And um, I think another one I wrote down, oh, in mainstream fiction, sexuality is portrayed I, I said what you said was very heteronormative which slowly changed as more diverse books are printed um but now we're seeing that pushback so many versions of kind of like the the messiah explorer right i mean it, one thing i wanted to talk about um later on was you know like problematic representations of sexuality so I'm not going to dive into this example right now but okay. um the things like june uh, yeah, so much you could say about June, uh, and lots of people rush to defend it because it's such a beloved um, text that you know means so much to so many people. But the the truth is that I I think that when when people are trying to represent otherness or or difference in terms of sexuality, if something is being used as a, a weapon, like you know, like you say, if, if something's basically being turned into um, an analogy for sexual sexual identity sexuality or um sexual enjoyment as a threat then you automatically have to kind of question like well why why are they doing that like where is that coming from and what's the intent and is this genuine or is this actually just very heavily masked religious propaganda or the prejudices of the author being dressed up as something else so i think that you know, getting beyond the kind of um, Garden of Eden, like they must go out and breed and reproduce the, the population of the entire new planet they've just found themselves on. Um, and another trope would be the kind of like, you know, fighting a, um, an alien horde or mm -hmm. a, an evil plague. And, and again, you could you could view that as, a okay, is this actually, an, you know, analogy for heteronormativity where what you're saying is that you know anything other anything that's outside the heterosexual experience or outside the comfort zone or and the sort of safety is what we view as kind of like a normal life has to be crushed or mm -hmm. destroyed because it's other and it's a risk and it's a threat and it will you know come in, in plant babies in your chest or something around the 1960s according to this same resource science fiction and fantasy begin to reflect the changes prompted by the civil rights movement and the emergence of a counterculture so new wave and feminist science fiction authors imagine cultures in a variety of gender models or atypical sexual relationships such as group marriages or homosexual single gendered societies as the norm and depictions of sex acts and alternative sexualities become commonplace um what are some what are some ways that you've seen speculative fiction break some of these these norms? Um, so, you know, this is a, a good example, I think, and one that I uh, I love as a series. But, you know, the, the Dragon Riders of Pern uh, series, I think, is, is a great way of sort of showing this, because in the Pern books, the, the sexuality of the Dragon Riders and the dragons is, is kind of incidental. It's just it's there. It's not problematized. It's not turned into um, a hitty stick to try and drive a political um, stance or to, to scare the reader. But it's there, it's spoken about, but in a very kind of de facto world building way where there's representation there, but it's done in a way which makes it feel very sort of domestic and, and normal. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it's part of the landscape. And I think that that's the, the kind of representation that, that I really appreciated um, when I found books like that growing up, because rather than um, tying into people's fears and insecurities and misinformation and 
you know, brimstone and um, fury about their religious beliefs or moral judgments. If you kind of take all of that away and it's just a, this is actually a, you know, a different form of relationship or this is a, a different kind of life, um, then it, it isn't inherently scary, but it also, it doesn't detract from the plot. It actually enhances it. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the Pern books are a great example. And yeah, ironically, you know, they were, I think, first published um, in the mid 1960s, mm -hmm. um, as was June, which is actually the, the opposite. So, you know, mm -hmm. I, I would, I don't know if we should move on to this one yet, or if it's a separate Go question. For it. Get <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, June, I've always really struggled with people's love for, because uh, when I read it, I was horrified as a teenager I actually stopped reading June because the representation of the Baron is so um sort of caricatured and hateful um and I gather that you know that there was a a lot of um discourse both at the time around publication and, and in the decades following um but I also you know I've seen the the original um June films I haven't seen the, the latest one and I refuse to to sort of engage with it as a fandom because I think that's a very clear example of an author weaponizing sexuality because mm. the Baron's sexuality is a point of disgust. It's it's part of what makes him um, reprehensible. Now, obviously, he isn't just um, a gay character. He's a paedophile and also an incestuous one. But it's kind of like tying into every possible negative caricature. Mm -hmm. You know, every every horrible, harmful trope. Um, and actually it just feels like homophobia in, in the yeah. character. Like if you were going to ask me to name like one fictitious representation of a character that basically embodied homophobia, it would probably be Frank Herbert's um, Baron. And it, it's quite clear that, you know, he had a, an openly gay son who he famously had a terrible relationship with and didn't approve of his uh, wow. lifestyle. And it shows, right? Like the evidence yeah. is there, it's in the book and it's in every, so whenever you kind of like, celebrate that book or further it you're also celebrating that representation and, and I personally think it's quite harmful so um yeah that, that's an example I don't like but also from the 1960s I would love to hear your your interpretation of J.K. Rowling troubled blood um centers on the disappearance of a woman quote, thought to have been a victim of Dennis Creed, a trans serial killer. So there was a critic named Jake Carriage who wrote, one wonders what critics of Rowling's stance on trans issues will make of a book whose moral seems to be never trust a man in a dress. The book appears to lean into problematic stereotypes portraying transgender people as villains, despite studies that show transgender people face high rates of harassment and violence. How do you, how, how is it over there with J.K. Rowling? Oh, God. Um, I, I could talk about this for, for hours. I actually, I wrote a, a, a pretty lengthy blog post about my thoughts on uh, J.K. Rowling, but that was predominantly about the Harry Potter universe. And I, I have had such a sort of strange journey because growing up, um, I was very much of the Harry Potter generation. I, I got handed the first book before they were famous and popular because I looked like the boy on the front cover literally my mum my mum saw this like bespeckled uh, boy with bad hair and glasses and gave it to her bespeckled boy with bad hair and glasses that's the, like, the level of um, you know my involvement so I, I was there from the beginning and I was an enormous fan of the series and I, I used to actually when I joined the publishing industry I used to defend the series quite a lot because I, I found the snobbery that people would kind of look down at J.K. Rowling and say nasty things about how the Harry Potter books didn't really deserve the success they got. Um, really unpalatable. Now, <laughs> I feel quite differently. And it's a really, it's a huge shame. But yeah, Troubled Blood is a very, very harmful book. It's, it's interesting because um, the pseudonym that J.K. uses for those crime books is Robert Galbraith. Now, there's been a few sort of overreactions almost um, on the internet about that because Robert Galbraith is um, most best known, aside from being JK's pseudonym, as a famous um, conversion therapist. So someone who used to oh. torture gay men uh, and, and try and know that. give them like electroshock therapy and other horrible treatments in order to address their homosexuality. Now, I am not for clarity trying to claim 
that that was J.K. Rowling's motivation in selecting Robert Galbraith as a pseudonym. However, I have worked in the publishing industry for 12 years, and for over four of those years, I've actually worked directly with Pottermore, like with their legal team mm -hmm. and with the company that she uses as a legal entity to publish content. And there is no way in any universe that lawyers weren't all over her potential pseudonym names <laughs> Let's yeah checking them fact checking them so it's not that she selected the name it's that if someone turned around to her and said oh um joanne you know that that name you were thinking of registering for your pseudonym it's actually um you know it, it might raise some some alarm bells for some people or it might be a bit un unsettling there is no way that name was not checked so i am mm -hmm. sure her legal team someone some poor sod at her literary agency would have been forced to look up the list of pseudonyms and see what competing probably just to, to check if there are any other big books published by that author because mm -hmm. when you're creating a pseudonym the whole point is that you go for something that's you know recognizable and iconic and um, memorable but you don't want it to clash with a, a real living author mm -hmm. because that would cause confusion so you know that the fact that <clears throat> she picked that name and then she kept it and now she's doing all of these horrible things where she's she's writing books that just um, play into tropes of transphobia. You know, it's it's really scary and unsettling. I haven't read Troubled Blood. But when when she first published the Robert Galbraith books, I wasn't aware of the the connotation of the U.S. because uh, he was an American-based conversion therapist. You know, it took a few years for the internet to kind of latch onto that as a potential inspiration maybe for that name so i read the early ones and I, I was actually very upset by the depictions in um one of her earlier books by th that same sort of comrade strike series the silkworm mm -hmm. because i thought that that was incredibly horrible to aspiring authors that there are some authors in there because that one's all centered around publishing so it's like it's a murder mystery plot but involving a literary agent and uh, an author and a few other potential suspects but you know it's all centered around the book industry and the characters that she mocks one of them is um sort of non-binary sort of gen gender diverse so again attacking the trans community but the thing that they kind of have in common is that she's constantly saying horrible things about self-published authors and it's wow. just that, that's that's when i lost all kind of sympathy for her because up until then jk did a, a great job of pring herself as a kind of like as a liberal, as someone who's left wing, as someone who's who's pro, you know, all kind of progressive values. And then it became really clear that she only means her kind of progression. She only she only wants the things that she believes in. And she doesn't actually have a lot of empathy or humanity for anyone who isn't like her. Mm -hmm. um, and I yeah, I find it really, really harmful. So with Troubled Blood, I'm aware of the, the snippets. I've read the quotes. I haven't read the full book because I refuse to give her any more of my mm -hmm. hard earned money. Um, but I think it's really harmful. And sh she's clearly got a political agenda. I mean, th the scary thing is, if you look at the timeline of the media coverage of the trans and non-binary community in this country here in the UK, and the um, the changes in terms of policy and of the way politicians are talking about it, you can kind of almost draw a straight dotted line between when JK started to get uh, outspoken about it on Twitter and wrote her um, Turf Wars blog post, which is quite famous now, and the increase in media outlets thinking, oh, great, this is a new community that we can start attacking. Because mm -hmm. here in the UK, you know, what we used to do, um, our media would always be blaming the EU. You know, when we were when we were a part of the European Union, mm -hmm. the British media loved to mock the European Union and its crazy, you know, fuddy duddy, um, progressive wokeness. And now we're not in the European Union anymore. We, we don't have the EU to blame for everything. They're looking for other groups, other minorities that you can turn into a scapegoat for all of society's ills. And it feels like JK Rowling and a number of other people have latched on to the trans community as something to to get angry about and it's very strange because you know she's still an author she's still writing very actively but if you look at her twitter timeline almost every day she's tweeting something about you know 
the, the trans community in a way wow. which is derog derogatory and harmful. And she's also <laughs> claiming to speak for, for all gay men and lesbians, um, apart from woke guys with beards. So mm. obviously I, I would probably fall into that latter category, but um, it's fascinating to me to sort of have loved someone as a author so much and have lost, you know, like mm -hmm. that, that earth is completely scorched. It's like she napalmed the Potterverse that lived inside my head. And now there's just this like charred, desolate rock and I can never go there anymore. Yeah. Well, I remember when she first started coming out with that stuff, and um, I, I, I was just thinking, well, I mean, because I was just as like you, right? I love the Harry Potter books, and looking into context, I think it's so important to look into context because there's a lot of very important uh, perspectives being brought up now about how things back then weren't as uh, considerate as they should have been. But living back in the day, the '90s to early 2000s, I remember being an Asian American mixed race child. I would grab at anything that showed representation and Cho Chang in the Harry Potter series I was like oh my god we have you know it, something right and and now yeah. you know the Asian American community is like you are aware that Cho Chang is like two last names um and it doesn't really show a, a respectful representation it's very generalized it's very um you know what's the word I'm trying to think of uh anyway um so then I'm like Oh my God, you know, like the realization that the one thing that you were clinging to is not great. So there was that. And then when they started, she started coming out with trans stuff. I saw it in the media first. I'm like, okay, that can't be right. Because I thought she was a leader of inclusivity. She was posting all these positive things that, that can't be right. Um, but then she not only leaned into it, it's like she dug her heel in and twisted. Like she wanted, like it's out. And I'm like, oh, never mind. <laughs> Okay. Um, very strange to have something that you trying to find representation wherever you could find it to then have that kind of ripped out from underneath you and realizing what the person is like underneath, not only her internal biases, but the fact that it's now being projected publicly and affecting others. It's so dangerous. And it's that betrayal feeling, especially because you're a child and you were impressionable. Um, so I totally get that heartbreak. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, I don't want to um, spend too much time on it, but I, I have exactly the same thing because, you know, for, for me, Hogwarts was uh, an enormous part of my childhood. Uh, I grew up with Harry, like literally the first three books. I was the same age as Harry. I I have the same birthday as Lord Voldemort. So oh. Tom Riddle has my birthday and like some of my friends growing up would call me Voldy or Tom as a joke because I was born on New Year's Eve and so was Lord Voldemort. Um, so, you know, like I had all of that. And then I found out that my great great auntie used to babysit for JK and is in one of the dedications like literally wow. a, a distant relative of mine is called out as helping Harry out of his cupboard which I used to really like because I used to think of it as like coming out of the closet and you know being a, a nice reference and now it's like oh why did you yeah. help her <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm trying to figure out those because it just came to me being able to navigate things uh that betrayal, that betrayal feeling where you have representation, then you realize it's not the best representation, then you realize it's actually bad representation. That's something that is, it feels like it's constant. Um, how do you handle that? How do you feel about that? I mean, I, I think it's important. I mean, it, it's such a complicated thing because I, I'm very pro imagination. I'm very pro people, you know, channeling their creativity and writing them what they want to write. But there's this, this whole thing where people are getting really defensive, you know, the cancel culture, the way people are constantly trying to sort of stop things from being critiqued, right? There is a huge difference between a critique, which can be constructive, informative, educational. You know, I've been on the same journey with like the, the problematic representation of, of gay men in Hogwarts and the Harry Potter series, like Dumbledore. I always knew Dumbledore was gay. I mean, his first appearance, he comes out in spangled, purple velvet mm -hmm. she couldn't have made him look more like an Oscar Wilde dandy if she tried <laughs> because he comes out in like purple and gold um so his representation as a sort of coded queer man was very apparent right from the beginning but what is Dumbledore Dumbledore is like an incredibly complicated and um distant figure who is powerful but also problematic mm -hmm. Dumbledore is central to the series but gets it wrong a lot. Dumbledore puts, you know, the not just the child that he's close to uh, on a familiar level because he was um, family friends with 
uh, that child's deceased parents, but he directly forms an unhealthy relationship with a minor student, has a relationship with the wizarding equivalent of Hitler. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. There's all these kind of reasons why Dumbledore is a bad character in many ways or, or not the great hero. I mean, he obviously is a hero in lots of ways too. So it, it's more complicated than that. But like, that's the representation she created for us was him the most complicated um contradictory figure that you could possibly imagine in a you know kids book series where he's both a great sort of savior figure but also the one directly throwing the lead character in harm's way and it's it's really kind of weird for me to kind of come to the conclusion that actually i hate that she used us like that you know i i really dislike that and i really dislike the way that um lycanthropy you know, werewolf representation was used as an allegory for um, HIV mm. and people living with um, being HIV positive or living with AIDS. I really dislike that she decided to use that as a fictitious trope um, because I think it was done in bad faith. And I think, you know, it was it was harmful and not nice. But the good thing is she had every right to do that. And I think there's this thing where, you, you know, you have to look at the the overall balance of like, do I want to control what other people write? I don't want to stop other people writing what, you know, whatever, whatever stories they need to tell. I do want them to tell those stories in a way which is respectful. And I do want them to tell those stories in a way which is well-researched and in good faith. So, you know, I think some of the, the conversations that happen now where people rush to sort of say, oh, well, this book's being cancelled by the left. It's like, well, it's not being cancelled, is it? It's just being called out. People are are highlighting the ways in which it isn't perfect or the ways it could have been done better or the ways in which it could be viewed as harmful. That That's not cancelling it. That's not saying, you know, pile them up and um, ban them, for example. It's just saying this isn't perfect. And I think, you know, no representation is perfect. You know, we as a society evolve. And I think it's really important that that evolution keeps happening. But the, the core thing is, and I I, I hope that um, people in other marginalized communities would agree with me on this, because, you know, I'm just speaking as a, a white cis gay man, which means that, you know, I have many other forms of privilege beyond being gay. So um, my understanding of being part of a minority community is just limited to being an openly gay guy living in the UK, where I'm, I'm actually very fortunate um, compared to the realities of a lot of other queer men across the world so what I would say is that it's really important that representation is done from a place of care and due diligence because more rep is good as long as it's being done with good intent what I hate seeing is characters you know like queer villains who are are there just because the villain can can be gay as well and that's just another form of you know, promoting his villainy. It's really lazy. I I think that, you know, marginalized communities deserve a voice in saying, actually, if you're going to represent us, can you at least get it right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that's, that's one of the things, right, with, with Harry Potter, you've got things like Seanus Finnegan, who's an Irish guy who blows up stuff. She wrote those books in the 90s, in, you know, the context of the Good Friday Agreement and the Troubles in Northern Ireland and was completely fine with putting a comedy Irish character in who blew stuff up all the time. Um, that's not very culturally mm-hmm. sensitive on any level. And, you know, you, you could uh, name a billion and one different examples where people just rely on basically stereotypes, right? Like tropes. If they're not of that minority culture, the easiest way they can represent it is by thinking, oh, well, you know, gay guys are always sassy or... <laughs> Yeah, always, always fashionable. So if I'm going to write this character, I'll make sure that they're really this, that, and the other. And it, it's lazy, but also it's not. It's not true. You know, like people's sexuality is such a a broad spectrum. Whether they're gay, bi, pan, um, polyamorous, you know, ace. That there's uh, so many different forms of sexuality. And for some people, they're very fluid. I mean, I've known I was gay since I was ten. And for me, my sexuality is is pretty binary because I, I've always felt this way and I've always been attracted to men. I've never been attracted to women in the same way. So, you know, I define as gay or queer, but I have other friends who are queer men who are far more sort of fluid or whose journey is kind of 
evolving or changing in terms of whether or not they view themselves as being bi or pan or poly and any kind of combination and that's all valid as well there isn't there isn't one perfect answer and i think fiction needs to reflect that so with you know when it gets to representing minority communities in speculative fiction in fiction in general um you can't have like one sort of pinnacle where like this is the paragon that every form of representation has to follow because the truth is we're all messy right like that's mm -hmm. everybody's got all of these different facets to them and sexuality gender identity um race you know there are so many ways in which people can live different lives and i think having an intersectional view of representation means that you have to kind of allow for more than one model right you can't just say right well this is what gay representation should look like and this is what sapphic uh, you know lesbian representation should look like because the truth is even if you try and do everything the right way and you reach out to the community that you might not be a part of and try and represent their lived experience you're not going to represent all lives in one example so you have to allow for a dialogue you have to actually like listen and learn and let people um you know say well this is a great example or i really enjoyed this because of x but this bit of it is problematic and maybe we should try and move away from that going forwards because otherwise um people just repeat the harm to marginalized communities for no reason and i i think we can do better one of my biggest fears and i've talked about this in a previous episode is i'm writing from a marginalized perspective but one of my biggest fears and i'll hear from other authors is doing it right and being well received from my own marginalized population. Do you feel that pressure? Yeah, massively. I mean, I I have no idea whether or not I'm ever going to be successful in securing an agent and securing a, a publishing deal, or if I'm going to get too bored and fed up and just self-publish. Um, <laughs> if I do self-publish, then it's very unlikely that you know it'll ever make headlines. Um, but if if I did you know, lift the dream and, and get a literary agent and then get um, a publishing deal with a, a major publisher and have my, my book promoted. I do think, well, you know, how are other people going to react to this? Because my, my book um, leans quite heavily on some autobiographical stuff. Um, it's basically a bit of a uh, love letter to the, the boy who was my first crush um but explored through like a fictitious lens so you know i, I won't say too much but there's a, a a young gay character a young bi character they meet when they're kids um i think the u.s equivalent would be like elementary school or maybe even kindergarten i'm not sure but they, they meet when they're really young kids and then they grow up together and it's set across three different timelines and they, they grow up playing computer games and there's all these sort of like nice fun things, but they, they actually live atop a hell mouth. So it's very um, oh, fun. But yeah, I think it's fun. Um, and we lived in this Tudor cottage, you know, like the Elizabethan Tudor era. Um, my family moved to a Tudor cottage immediately after my dad died. And there was a well, the village well was in the back garden. So there was this like centuries old ancient and also like horrible looking well that was just part of our back garden. And it used to belong to the whole village. And then it was just like carved up uh, and made part of the, the garden of our cottage. So in, in my um, book universe, that is the epicenter of the Hellmouth, right? The, the Hellmouth is underneath the well, basically. Awesome. That's so cool. um, well, you know, I feel you, you've got to weaponize your childhood trauma, right? I, I <laughs> like, oh, gosh, I, you're speaking to the person who did that, too. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I've got all of that. Bit. And basically, the, the guys uh, grow up together. They go to different schools. They bond. They, they have fallouts. There's a, a love triangle and then like a love rhombus situation. And, you know, it's very well. They won't though in lots of ways as they um, grow up. But eventually um, they get latched onto by the hellmouth. And the, the whole kind of thought behind that is that because they're falling for each other, um, you know, like their, their light is um, more attractive to the darkness. So like, that's why the Hellmouth latches onto them as the conduit to opening up. And what happens is that um, the gay character has this great like grand plan for them finally getting together. And it all revolves around them playing the final installment of their favorite computer game. They're gonna play it together. It's the third in the series. And then after that, they're gonna go on this amazing camping trip. And during the camping trip, he's finally gonna tell the, the boy that he's been in love with um, that he's in love with him. 
And then the games developer pull the plug on the game and are like, oh, we're going to save it for the next next generation console, which happens in the gaming world a lot. Like you can be really hyped up and excited for this big gaming release. And then two weeks before it's due to come out, the games developer can be like, ah, we're going to have to wait for the next console for that. Oh. Um, yeah, so that the gay character panics and goes on the dark web, um, you know, like the the um, unofficial sort of naughty internet that um, does really exist, but we never really talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and he goes on the dark web and finds a pirate copy to download. And it comes with all these warnings that if he plays that copy, it might corrupt his system. But actually, he's not getting that from the dark web. He's getting it from the Hellmouth. <laughs> And they start to play it, and then the world starts to unravel because the more they play, the more the Hellmouth opens, and then they have to try and stop Amazing. it. Amazing. So that's what I've written, and it's got loads of gaming geekery, lots of um, like X Men references and the like, as well Amazing. as computer game it. stuff. Um, but I'm very aware of the fact that like it represents me, my imagination, my passions, and my imaginary bisexual, um, you know protagonist who's the, who's the counterpoint to the the gay character i'm not bi so i've i've had lots of my bi friends read it and i've asked them like is this okay because i'm not bisexual and you know i i i don't know whether or not i'm doing a good enough job for you guys and also you know my gay character he's not going to be representative for all gay men on the planet i'm sure there's going to be lots of gay guys reading that whole thing oh well i wouldn't have done that or he's he's far too you know flawed and problematic for me um but for me I can only write the characters that I want to write but I have attempted to do my research I have attempted to to reach out for other people for sort of sensitivity read because personally I think that there's no problem with having sensitivity reads I don't why I don't understand why anybody would object to being sensitive when talking about things outside their lived experience mm -hmm. I'm I'm quite strident on the stuff that I've included from my lived experience because I lived it. <laughs> so yeah. some of my friends are like, oh, that's a bit dark, or that's a lot to happen when you're a kid. And I'm like, yep, it stays in because I it literally happened or yeah. a version of it happened. So that can stay in because I know that stuff like that can happen because I, I lived it. Yeah, um, you don't want to erase your own experience and lose that voice. No, and and you know, who knows if, if it ever makes um makes it out into the world then A, I'll make sure that I send you a copy. Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe people maybe people will enjoy it. Maybe people will see themselves represented. I don't know. But all I do know is that I think we, we can't let ourselves get to the stage of stifling creativity or silencing ourselves, silencing our own voices and our own memories and um, stories because of fear, right? That, that would be really counterintuitive, like just because of the fear of offence or the fear of it not being perfect, to not try and share my voice to not try and um have my lived experience out there contributing seems mm -hmm. kind of wrong and because you know what will we then entering into where you you have to have all of these factors ticked off a list before you get a chance to communicate it i, th I think that th there's a big enough world out there for everybody to tell their stories as and as long as you do it with good intentions and uh, you know the, the right kind of moral compass driving it so you're not trying to harm other people you're not trying to peddle misinformation you're not trying to sort of like secretly push a load of religious or political so i mean maybe you are some people some people want to do that in fiction personally i you know i was force fed the narnia books as a kid and even as like a seven-year-old i was like ah, this is just a bible yeah <laughs> you know, like, yeah <laughs> Taking into context, like what you were raised under, what influences you had, um, being able to challenge harmful stereotypes while also not like falling into another set of stereotypes, um, especially because conformity, I feel, can go both ways. You have the conformity that you're expected to have from society if you're considered other, but then there's the conformity that might inadvertently happen when, when, when. Uh, for example, I have a very specific relationship I have with my mom. Not every Asian American mother daughter relationship is the same, but I don't want to erase mine to conform with what other the, the louder uh, population says, because then you've lost that diversity itself. Yeah, and and why should you? You know, like for a start, that, that is your lived experience. But for a second, like the the world can contain more than one. I know people say there's only seven plots or whatever, but the, the truth is, we're all more complicated than I think we let anybody truly realize, you know, like everybody <clears throat> perceives each other through multiple lenses, 
but we all have lots of different facets. We all have more history than anybody expects. And we're all quite complicated in our own unique, exactly the same way. <laughs> you know, like everybody has their own stuff, right? But, but you can't let the fear of um, other people, you know, not liking your version, stop you from communicating it. Because that would be wrong, right? And also, if what are you doing instead? If, if you did write um, a more traditional Asian American mother daughter dynamic, but it wasn't your lived experience and it wasn't something that you actually believed in. You'd just be writing it as a stereotype to conform to mm -hmm. the trope, right? So then yep. you're, you're almost like writing it deliberately in bad faith, yes. which I think is way worse. That's true. You're not helping your community at all that way. Uh, and the beauty of it is then people will read it and they'll go, Oh my gosh, I had the same exact feeling. And then that, that validation, they're like, Oh my gosh, I've enabled and empowered someone else to come out now with their story is really powerful. So you have given a lot of great advice. I have a question dedicated to advice. So for writers, and knowing that you were from both sides of the industry, uh, what, what advice do you have for writers when it comes to writing sexuality and fiction? And um, furthermore, if they're writing outside of their own sexual identity, how can they make sure to be inclusive? Um, so I, I think I, I touched on it earlier on, but I think that the primary thing I'd recommend is research. Um, so, you know, like research and outreach. So, you know, make sure if you know that you're telling somebody else's story, um, make sure that you're doing it respectfully and from a place that actually, you know, you, you're putting care into it, you're putting due diligence. But I, I'd even go a little bit further and think, why? You know, like, why am I, why am I doing this? Like, what's... What's the real motivation? If I'm being brutally honest with myself, am I writing this because this is the story I have to tell and I'm really passionate about it and these characters live in my head rent free and I know that I need to communicate their story and I've got it all plotted out? Or is it a bit more cynical than that? Because uh, the one thing I worry about a lot um, as you know, more diverse publishing is happening, which is something I've longed for and lobbied for for a really long time. So I'm really delighted to see more diverse books out in the world and I want that to continue. I don't want it to be a trend. I want it to just be a part of the ecosystem, a part of the landscape. And I mean that not just you know in terms of LGBTQ plus representation, but generally I just want more minority voices which have been marginalized to have the representation that they deserve. But I hate it when I can see something that I think is just like a cynical ploy or a bit mm -hmm. of like a bad faith, a bit of inclusivity where it's like, ah, oh, and I'm just going to mention this because if I do that, then that's a hook, right? Um, I'm not going to name it, but there is a, a YA book that I read uh, a few years ago that I've seen listed as being queer. Now, the author doesn't identify as queer, as far as I know. I've never seen that in any of the press. It's not in any of their, you know, it's not on their website. It's not in any of the profiles because I did actually go away and check because I thought, okay, this is a queer book. I'm going to take that as, you know, true, but I will dig into it and double check. The author doesn't identify as being queer. One of their characters is queer slash gay. That character I thought was a terrible 2D stereotype and was actually incredibly harmful. And therefore them being sort of centered in this kind of um, really high octane, gossipy YA setting, just seemed like a really bad faith bit of cynical inclusivity, right? Where mm. they were using the fact that, oh, and if I make that character gay, that's an interesting twist. And then I can make them, you know, sassy and slightly toxic. And, and you know that's fine because that's that's inclusive it's not really <laughs> like what you just don't you just put a, a bad character who's deeply flawed with very few redemptive qualities centered everything around them in a way that makes them seem worse and pulls out all of their you know most extreme toxic traits and you're using that as your example of gay men great thank you mm -hmm. that, that, that's what that's what we need in terms of representation so i think veer away from anything that is being driven by wanting to pander to the market you know I think if someone wants to include different sexualities or different gender identities difference in their books that's fine as long as it comes from a place of authenticity and as long as it's actually something that is integral to the story and not just something very very cynical because you know if you're deliberately including uh, queer characters because you want to market it to the queer community rather than you genuinely want to tell that story, you genuinely care about it, you genuinely believe in it. That's not great representation. That's just uh, 
trying to take people's money. So mm. I, that that's my kind of take on it. I mean, I I think that the primary thing people can do is look into sensitivity readers. There's lots of great um, freelance sensitivity readers out there. There's a couple of organizations that bill themselves as um, sensitivity specialists. And that's a great way, whatever, you know, marginalized um, community you're trying to represent, whether it's um, sexuality, gender identity, racial, neurodivergent, there's lots of different ways you can be sensitive to representing people outside your lived universe. But you've got to be doing it for the right reasons, right? If you're just trying to do it to cash in on somebody else's life, like, a, shouldn't you let that community tell their own story to a point? Um, and B, like, what, what are you really driving at? Like, do you think that you're going to be contributing positively? Or are you just making a cynical ploy for money? And I, I sometimes fear that some of the stuff I see that's being billed as being mega inclusive. Not actually that inclusive. Like, um, you know, th there are a lot of things that got published with great fanfare, um, like, I think American Dirt is a really controversial book that got a lot of praise when it was first published and is actually quite problematic in many ways. And I saw this interview where people were saying, well, you know, but the what you have to understand is that the author's husband is an immigrant. Mm. The, the author's husband is a, an Irish citizen. So they're a white person in America. This is the one about Mexican immigration, right? Uh, and yeah. I think at the book release, I heard I read a story about how they had I don't know if this is rumor or not, but that their centerpieces had like barbed wire or s yeah. some incredibly <clears throat> offensive representation. It's it's exactly that. It, it had barbed wire all, all around the, the tables just for dramatic effect. Now, but publishers often use props and sometimes they're a bit tacky. And, and but that's just tasteless. Right. Like that, that is just really insensitive and very harmful. And, you know, look at the, the people who are commissioning that book and the people who are promoting it. They're not from that community. Like, it would mm. be different if it was people from that country saying, like, this is an acceptable way for us to, and if that was the author's lived experience. But my understanding is that that's a, a white American lady who wrote that book. And the, the, you know, oh, well, you know, she was inspired by the strife and struggles of her immigrant husband. That immigrant husband is from Ireland. Mm -hmm. So an Irish person mm -hmm. in America from the brief, you know, I've only been to the States once so far and I plan on coming back to visit very soon. But um, my experience was that, you know, you're not treated uh, in any way badly or othered as a European in America. In fact, it, yeah. everybody seems insanely nice about Europeans in America because it's almost like we're exotic birds or something that just wandered out of the zoo. Once we hear the accent. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know the queen? Do I know the queen? Well, no, I am a queen, but no. um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Do you have any additional um, remarks that you'd like to make or promotions? I, I really enjoyed chatting with you. This is fantastic. Likewise, uh, the only thing I'm going to mention, because this is how we initially first started talking, well, I wanted to talk about X-Men and Phoenix. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yes, tell me all about it. <laughs> that's what it came about. Um, but I, I just, you know, I, I love X-Men and mm -hmm. Phoenix is one of my very, very favorite characters. But I do think there's something really, really fascinating about like taking the all-American sweetheart figure of Jean Grey, mm -hmm. giving her ultimate power and then deciding do you know what she should be a bad girl right mm -hmm. like it's it's almost akin to like the the weird retribution arc and redemption arc that Britney's had where you know like she's sweet she's innocent she's perfect she's everything then she's destroyed she's nothing she's being used by her family and then she's back on the plinth and being celebrated again and it feels like Jean Grey and Phoenix you've got this weird kind of continuity where she's the most powerful ex-person in every universe for large stretches of time mm -hmm. but the major thing is that she's just she makes really bad life choices <laughs> yes <laughs> just... oh my god okay so I used to watch X-Men in the 90s loved that show Same. I told I loved Rogue I think because I grew up in a hyper conservative household that rogue's inability to like physically touch like i i was like rooting for you rogue you know um but with jean what frustrated me beyond all ends was that she was so yeah very on a pedestal very idolized was it seemed amazing but she always seemed to have 
issues that prevented her from reaching her full potential, whether it's like, oh, it's just, oh, it's just too much. Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> you know, like uh, when she's using her her mental problems and she had like, my, I'm sorry, mental powers and Xavier has to help her. And I just kept going like, if she's so powerful, as everyone is saying, why do they keep kind of holding her down narratively, yeah. character wise? So I see what you mean about her. And then, I mean, they, they changed it all with the, the, the Phoenix Saga, um, both the original one and then the Dark Phoenix Saga. They then gave her like unlimited power, but then she was she was too powerful. And I think the writers kind of realized that with a character like Phoenix in the mix, it's like where you're always going to have this sort of like secret source because she's a cosmic goddess, basically. So th they had to find ways of limiting her power. And there were a couple of different narrative arcs. I don't want to put too many spoilers in for people who haven't read the original Phoenix comics, but you really should because they're brilliant. I love them. But um, the, the interesting thing about it is they, they take this like good girl and then they make her in Dark Phoenix into like the biggest badass, like she commits a lot of crimes um, mm -hmm. very briefly because it only happens over a few issues, but she does things in Dark Phoenix that like no other evil villain in the X-Men universe does for decades. And it's, it's really kind of like fascinating to see how much the writers kind of reveled in taking this character that had been so sweet and innocent and everything nice and then thinking actually do you know what she can go bad she can go you know as, as bad as possible um and it's like the original kind of like am i the villain thing she, she suddenly is like oh i don't think i'm the villain i don't think i'm the villain um and it's, it's amazing to me but i i just i loved it so much I, I always go back to that um those two comic books the original phoenix saga and then the dark phoenix one i i love them to bits but they are fascinating and then you know afterwards they're like right let's just wash our hands with it because it was all very messy um but you know the great thing about x-men is they're constantly retconning everything <laughs> so yeah the, the old narratives always come back <laughs> I never talk about the uh, Phoenix Saga films because they're terrible. I think the the only thing that everybody kind of agrees on is that we do not speak about the X-Men films, mm. particularly X-Men 2 or whatever it was where they they tried to do Phoenix and just messed it up. Um, but that was when they kind of, they took the blinkers off Phoenix uh, and Jean Grey. They kind of took Jean Grey and were like, right now, you can be everything that you've always had the potential to be. But the problem is, oh, it's too much all at once. And, yeah. and what does that lead you? It, mm, you know, ultimate power comes ultimate corruption. So, so my exposure to the Jean Grey so was I think there were a couple episodes in the '90s cartoon, and then I just I don't know if the cliffhanger my memory's faint. And then of course the X Men two, and then the most recent X Men. And to me, it always felt like the way they treated and my what I assumed about Phoenix was that it was like a really big firework flash and then done because she was so powerful that everything just kind of came to an end. Is that how it is in the comics too, or does it go on from there? um so for for a while they they played around with it so the, there's the original like phoenix arc <clears throat> where um basically phoenix is a, a guardian force that's invoked um to help the x-men fight the shiar um because there's the evil shiar emperor i can't remember his name at the moment but there's an emperor who is trying to get hold of the emkron crystal and the emkron crystal is basically um a galaxy in itself so if you if you were to open that crystal and channel its power, you'd have the power of an entire galaxy, which is what the evil emperor tries to do. And this is where you have like Xavier's psychic wife, who's a really fascinating character, um, who's called, oh God, that's gonna really annoy me, L Lilandra, Lilandra. So L Lilandra of the Shi'ar is the sister of Taken, and Taken is the evil emperor. Taken is the one who's trying to open the Emkron crystal. And basically, in the, the course of their adventures, Jean Grey ends up going with um, the other X-Men up to Space Station. This is before they know what's happening, before they know about Ken and the Shi'ar and what's going on with the crystal. And then when they're trying to return to Earth, Jean Grey kind of literally has to sacrifice herself mm -hmm. to keep the other X-Men alive. And when she does that, the Phoenix Force, basically like flying throughout the cosmos, finds her and latches onto her as a host body because she's so powerful, but also she's doing such a sort of incredibly wholesome thing and saving her loved ones. And it bonds with her instantly. And then for a while, like they have lots of issues where Phoenix Force basically does, it saves the day. It's like a magic wand in narrative terms, you know, Deus Ex Machina, you just have whoop, Phoenix yeah. Force will save everything. And they, they managed to, you know, stop the evil emperor. Um, then they, they actually, at the end of that arc, 
killed off both Phoenix and Jean Grey, and then obviously love of the character and for narrative reasons brought her back. When she comes back, then there's a, a while where she doesn't have a Phoenix powers, then they resurface, then again, there's like quite a few issues where different things happen. And then all of a sudden they bring in the Hellfire Club, which is interesting because the Hellfire Club is the first kind of representation of Emma Frost. Oh. So Emma Frost's, um, you know, Emma Frost's first kind of um, narrative appearance is being one of the, the like the, the super villains of the Hellfire Club, but she's being used specifically to um, unlock the psychic blinkers that Xavier tries to build around Jean Grey's Phoenix Force to protect her. Because the, basically what they realize is that when Jean Grey comes back, she's altered irrecoverably. The Phoenix Force doesn't want to leave her, her body, it refuses. But also the Phoenix Force, like it wants to live, right? It's not, it's not actually had a sensory existence up until Jean. So when it comes back, it wants to taste everything like it doesn't just want the, the nice stuff it wants wants to try chocolate it wants to try everything <laughs> um, and that leads to um you know this sort of like weird thing where you have Xavier doing something which is a bit problematic because he's technically he's kind of like putting uh mental cages within Gene like he's going inside Gene Gray's brain and messing about with stuff to try and contain the Phoenix Force in a way that you know Gene kind of consents to but she doesn't really have a choice and it's very so. I think it's really interesting in terms of you know sexuality and everything else. Having a, a an old straight man go into this incredibly powerful young woman's brain and start messing about with stuff, and then mm. when em Emma Frost starts undoing those bonds and releases Phoenix, that's when she goes bad and turns into the Dark Phoenix, which is when it gets very interesting. How okay? So then, sexuality and X Men. How do you think they did in general? So, I mean, I've, I've always loved the X-Men um, and I love it now even more than I did as a kid. And I, I always thought it was, uh, you know, analogous um, mm -hmm. to being queer, but I was always very frustrated by the fact that, you know, until Iceman's great retcon with Bobby Drake being um, the first openly gay X-Man, we didn't have any real queer representation for forever. But what I liked was they retconned that so much that they basically went back and said, nope, Actually, in every historic thing of Iceman you've ever seen, even when he was sleeping with a woman, he was still a gay man. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> if, you're gonna, if you're going to do a big series retcon and take a, a character who's existed for like five decades <laughs> and then say, right, they're gay, don't just do it in like a small token way. Like go full fat on that. Go, go really to town and say, yep, actually, they've always been gay. And every time they've slept with a woman, it's been a lie. <laughs> <laughs> which gotcha. is basically what they did with Iceman and I think you know X-Men is is an incredibly uh important cultural phenomenon I would say because it's it's always represented the outsiders right the, the X-Men are by their very definition like the others so they're, they're always going to be a great way of looking at like marginalized heroes however <laughs> that doesn't mean that they're not sometimes problematic and that the representation isn't isn't really bad. I mean, there's a, a fantastic podcast you might be aware of called Cerebro. I have not heard of it. No, at all. Is it about X Men? Or... It, it's completely about X Men. That's all okay. it's about. But it, it but it's done by a, a great guy who's actually a literary agent uh, called Connor Goldsmith, and he has the most incredible guests on talking about X Men. Um, I re-listened to the very first episode recently, which was about Betsy. Brannock, which I can never really take seriously because Betsy is not what English people would call Elizabeth, right? She'd be a Betty or a Lizzie mm. or a Liz. But for <laughs> some reason, Betsy Brannock is um, who becomes Psylocke. So you have this weird thing where for, for decades, Betsy Braddock, like the, the, the character of Betsy Braddock, who was um, the sister of Captain Britain, which is the, our version of Captain America. Mm. We got Cap Captain Britain. He had a, a telepath, you know, telekinetic sister uh, who at one point gets it through the magic of Avalon, which is, you know, an alternative dimension that happens to have a bit of Arthurian law whacked in there to give it extra Brit points. Um, but, you know, like they created this character in Betsy Braddock and then they, they turned her into Psylocke. What they did was they literally put the brain or the, the personality um, and the sentiments 
of Betty Brannock into an Asian character's body and turn that into Psylocke. And they've now recently undone that. So you now have the incredible um, Japanese ninja character who's getting to live her own narrative and Betsy restored to a, a newly you know, restored body. But for years, that was the only Asian rep in X-Men, mm -hmm. right? Like Psylocke, mm -hmm. but she wasn't even properly because she had a British woman's mind in her body. Yeah. The whole time. <laughs> it's, it's literally wearing a costume of an Asian woman. For well, I mean, yeah, a little bit. I mean, I think what they've tried to do, and again, this is where I give X-Men points, because I think when they do try and retcon something for the right reasons, they do try and do it right. So what they, they made it very clear was like, it wasn't a created body. It wasn't a made body or a morph body. It was a, an actual woman with her own life. And then... That I can't remember. Sorry, it's been a while since I listened to the episode. I a, can't remember Psylocke's um, like the, the the true Psylocke avatar body character name, and I can't remember the evil force that merges them together. But what it basically does is it takes a bit of both of them and then plays around. So <clears throat> what they've tried to create is that there was always a woman who had her own life, and then Betsy was um, almost like psychically. Took her forced over. into that shell yeah. yeah but not not intentionally like she didn't consent to it neither of them had any choice over it but it happened and for for decades both of them completely lost agency or control of their own bodies and now it's quite interesting because we're now at a stage where um there are you know proper comic book series running where both these characters get their own proper arc and they get to be themselves They're, there's no longer this weird thing where they've just like merged these two characters together in a way which doesn't really fit interesting well, thank you for teaching me about that. My memory is very foggy when it comes to X-Men because I was really into it like 15 years ago, but I love seeing the, the, the legacy continue as more movies are being produced. So, and I remember, yeah, you're right. We, when we first met on Twitter, um, that was brought up. So it was really cool to be able to talk about that. I, I really enjoyed having this chat. I hope that you find representation soon. Um, it's a crazy, it's a crazy world out there. So um, hang in there and hopefully you know, you'll get something. How long have you been on, uh, what is it called? A querying? How long have you been querying? I've been querying for uh, just over a year, really. Um, okay. And and I've had some, some very sort of exciting conversations and it, it lead nowhere. And I've had someone give me some um, R&Rs, you know, revise and mm. resubmits. Yes. Um, but I haven't really found the, the one, you know. It, mm. it, if, feels like when you're querying you're basically in a bad dating game yeah. where you're just looking for that perfect match mm -hmm. <laughs> and until you find them it's like I'm just gonna keep knocking on those doors but um I will continue persevering for a little while longer and you know hopefully it'll work out if it doesn't then I know how to self-publish my books so if I need to I can always take that route if I have to and I'm, I'm keeping I'm writing something else now anyway so I'm gonna keep going uh, that's more of like a, a proper gay rewrite of Frankenstein, which won't be a shock given our earlier conversation. I love that. Okay, great. Speculative Sandbox is a volunteer-run podcast that relies on the collaboration of fellow creators like you. Join the conversation and participate in fun polls and questionnaires on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Interested in being in a future episode? Our DMs are open, or you can email speculativesandbox at gmail.com.